Uh, Jordi from Spain. Uh, I actually wanted to touch uh, about the topic that the discussions brought, which is uh, financing, no? And like it's shown that let's say this lobbyism power has much more fini financial capa capabilities than the counter power does. So in the case of economics, for example, we have some foundations that want to create this counter expertise, no? as I don't know, the New Economics Foundations, Positive Money, and so on. And most of them are basically here because they're founded by George Soros, who is a random rich guy that, for some reason, uh, wants to found this heterodox uh, world. But if it wasn't for him, it seems that the, any of these counter expertise would uh, exist. So my question would be, how can we secure that some financing goes to this counter power, counter expertise, and if it's the public budget is a possibility for that, uh, other than individual transfers in which you're relying <laughs> that some rich dude uh, or person goes against his maybe economic interest as it, it is that case. Okay, please don't forget, Kilian, to introduce yourself. Kilian, uh, from France. Um, I want to know your opinion on uh, on this question, uh, is it possible to think about um, uh, lobbying without uh, speaking of uh, the economic system? Uh, uh, because even if we had more transparency, more uh, like equity, uh, NGOs have more power, but uh, multinationals have the power to influence uh, 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 en dehors des, des lobbies, enfin, yeah. autre part. Yeah, yeah. Uh, through different ways, uh, by the lobby, they can, uh, they have the money to, to publish some uh, paper or false paper to to save their interest, they have the power to say, if we are not happy with your politic, we can uh, go in uh, Asia, in uh, South America. So is it possible to speak about lobbying uh, without uh, putting in question the, econo um, the whole economic system? So there was a last question here. Okay. So now it's man questioning. Please. Women stand up. <laughs> well, thank you for your presentation. It was truly interesting, and thank you, Matt and Carol. I think you add a lot also to the discussion. Uh, since, thank you. Sorry, I'm Juan from Argentina. I my question maybe it's a, a bit outside of the realm of European Union, but I wanted to ask. Uh, you talk about uh, also cooperation between uh, firms, for example, or lobby groups and uh, the state or the regulatory ent entities. And at least I have a bias, uh, and I admit this a bias, that we, we are always facing, at least in Argentina, as enemies. Like the firms wants to, I don't know, take as much as they can from uh, the people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I, um, we also have also this problem of how to build power in the political landscape. And we're always thinking, and, no, we cannot take this measure because it's uh, the, interest, the interest we are touching, they are too powerful. And they can, for example, make a, I don't know, currency crisis or balance of payment crisis because we are touching or we are taxing certain multinationals. So uh, connecting these two points, I wanted to ask if you know any experience or how to start thinking about uh, this cooperation in, in, in the way to build stronger uh, blocks that may face in the future uh, taxing such strong industries or strong multinationals in the realm of maybe developing countries that are more exposed to certain crises or are more exposed to multinational veto power. Well, thanks for this first wave of questions. So I saw you, Clara, but it will be for the next wave, the second wave. It's like COVID, we have waves here. So, Laura, you have 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> ah, yeah, sorry, oh, yeah. I, now oh. I forget. <laughs> um, 
the Soros thing is, is really interesting. Um, so just so that you all get also a picture, because Soros was uh, criticized a lot in Hungary, and it's interesting to see where he comes from and why he funds a lot of NGOs in Brussels. Um, he's from a Jewish family that had to leave because of Nazism, Nazism in uh, Germany, in Hungary. Ooh, sorry. He left to the States and he studied in uh, London. He studied finance and politics, or finance and philosophy. And um, he was super impressed by Poliani. And the theory of Poliani is that the na Nazism and fascism only come up when you have a society that is too closed. So you don't have enough different voices. And that's how you get authoritarian regime. And that's the basis of how he gives out his money politically. Uh, is because he believes that you need different diverging voices in order to keep democracy alive. Financially, he has an interest in giving money to all of those NGOs in Brussels because he obviously pay less taxes in the US. Eh? <laughs> uh, and it's good that you also mentioned Soros because I work for an NGO that do also get money from Soros and it's very important when you, t when you get civil society speaking and to know where the money comes from. So that's also, he's also indirectly paying for my salary. Uh, but he's not the only one that uh, gives money in, in for NGOs. You also have other foundations like Adesium. You have some organizations that only get money from donations like Greenpeace. So Greenpeace EU unit gets money from all the Greenpeaces across Europe. It's mostly Greenpeace Germany because it's Greenpeace Germany that's the biggest one in, in Europe. Uh, and some organizations do get money from the EU. So the European Environmental Bureau, which represents uh, really big uh, environmental organization gets money from the European Commission and Business Europe gets money from the European Commission. So the European Commission um, is giving money to what they call civil society voices and they give half to business interest and half to NGOs. So there's also other ways of funding. Um, I think funding is important but as I was also trying to say there's a whole thing about framing. So you're more relevant if the framing of the discussion, mm, let me do it again. If you're Greenpeace and you have only one person working on chemicals, but you have a commission that really wants to take away chemicals from the market, the dangerous one, maybe Greenpeace only needs one person and doesn't need that much money, right? But if you are Greenpeace and you have one person on chemicals and you have a commission that really wants to improve all the chemicals in the world, then you need a lot of money, right? So it's not just about money, it's also about the framing of the political debate, if it's in your interest or not. It's about your level of the a have access, if you have access to Ursula von der Leyen. And it's also, again, timing, as I was saying. If you get early access to high-level people, that's really a good way of influencing. Eh? It's as much, as, as much yeah, money, money can buy this, but not always. But when you think of NGOs, you also have to think about this. Um, also, something that, that gives up a, a link to the second question, um, I met once a very old, uh, high-level uh, person in the European Commission and he was very supportive of what we were saying. He agreed, but he kept on uh, talking to me about the history. And he said, oh, you know, when Delors, so that's uh, 25 years ago, was a uh, president of the Commission, he really believed in social dialogue and he felt that uh, we will be creating these European company associations, but then we'll create a European trade union and we'll have a European social dialogue and we will really be able to create something very social and very uh, fair in Europe. And he was saying that uh, Delors was strongly believed in this and what happened is that the trade unions were, became weaker and weaker and basically was saying it's because of the trade unions. But what was interesting is saying is that at some point there was probably a will from the Commission to create powerful European industry, but also try to create maybe Euro powerful European trade unions. And it didn't happen. And the link here is with what you were saying with the economic system. It's clearly true that um, it has a huge, uh, in the economic system that we live in, um, clearly uh, lobbies have a lot of power. Also because, for instance, at the moment, there's a lot of discussion about sovereignty, about how we need to build European champions. And this is because the USA and China are having big tech companies and Europe doesn't have one. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, Breton, uh, who's the, the French commissioner for internal market, he comes, he used to be the CEO of a company. He became commissioner. There's no, never a trade union leader that became a commissioner, right? So it was okay to get a CEO from a company, become a commissioner, he was fine. And also when he presents himself, so not long ago he was doing a political event and he said very proudly, oh, I'm the commissioner for internal market, so I'm basically commissioner for industry. 
and companies. And you're like, well, internal market is also about workers, guys, you know? It's not just about uh, corporations. And it's what you were saying, you know? It's, it's the idea that the internal market is corporations. When the internal market is also consumers, it's also workers. And this is not part of the mindset of the leaders. So, yeah, I hope I... Um, did I reply your answer? Yeah, more or less? Okay. Um, I'm less clear about your answer, sorry, about your questions. Um, how do we create a block in the developing countries against firms? Uh, no, sorry. Maybe, uh, maybe it's me. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, I, I might be tired. Your name is Juan, right? Uh, no, sorry. I also did a lot of round to the question. Basically, is sometimes in Argentina, for example, to put an example, we say let's nationalize this foreign company because ah, it's okay. strategic. Uh -huh. And some people, even in the, the, uh, in the progressive uh, political uh, environment, let's say, says no, if we nationalize this, it's too dangerous, we don't have the power to do it because after this we will have, I don't know, capital outflows because ah. the investors are not trusting in us. So when you, we, you start talking in, at first about doing some, uh, let's say, alliances or cooperation between, for example, national firms mm. and the state, doing lobbying. And I, I think that's innovative, at least for me. And I want you to maybe talk a little bit about more, expand on that point because it's interesting to build this power in order to then take bigger battles, maybe. But maybe it's not the... It's to build, so to topic. build national firms that will Thank be close you. to government. Yeah. 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 No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it's, it's difficult because uh, you, get, you have different ways of nationalization. Um, EDF in France is a lot national. It's a big company, it's a big lobby power. And what it means is now nuclear is n uh, not something you can't discuss in France. Like it has been nuclear, there's nothing else. Even though most countries don't want it anymore in the EU. So sometimes it's not because you have national firms that you actually have more progressive firms, you know? Um, it really depends how it's made. And a good example for this is water companies. Um, Paris nationalized its water system. It's an, it's a, it's a public uh, entity, but it has a citizen, some citizen control. So consumers are also on the board, workers are on the board. And uh, so it's not just the state having all the political power on the board of the company. So I would say that it's not because they're national firms that they actually are more progressive. And you really have to look about how they are, they've been nationalized. Yeah, that's as much as I can say. Uh, two or three years when I came, I was, I was talking about something else is about ISDS. Um, in the case of Ar Argentina, uh, renationalizing fir re firms would mean that you probably get sued by uh, uh, European uh, uh, companies also. So that's another thing. Uh, again, I could speak for hours about this, but uh, there might be this coming into play also in the case of Argentina. That's as much as I can say. Okay. So it's time for the second wave, and at last we have women. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> and don't forget to introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Elle, I'm from France. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for the discussion. It was really interesting. <coughs> I'm Elle, from France. <laughs> okay, so uh, it's really quick. I just, I was super curious because you mentioned the carbon market. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know, according to you, um, who benefit from the carbon market instead of imposing the global tax for carbon emission? And also you mentioned that there is an NGO that was uh, pushing it this way. And I was just curious which NGO was it. And uh, yeah, if you have more information about it. And uh, also I was curious, uh, even though like they implement a, a carbon tax, a global carbon tax in Europe, how does it work if in the rest of the world didn't, doesn't, don't do that? Um, yeah. Just your opinion on that. Thank you. Okay, next question. Another woman. Hi, I'm Natalia from Colombia. I have a question and, and a comment. The question is, um, I, and I think it is my interpretation of Juan's okay. question, is more or less um, in the case of a progressive government arriving into the power, 
you will need to face um, the oh, like the boycott or opposition of big groups, uh -huh. even national, like from the national elites, for example. So the question is more or less how what kind of strategies do you know to um, to counterbalance it, and how how you like from the government perspective would negotiate with this kind of uh, big economic groups uh, that yeah when when the interests could collide somehow so how how do you ne how would you negotiate that and then the observation is a little bit is that yeah we have lobby as a part of like the political system but we we still have democracy so so and that's the main thing and democracy has a, has a lot of expression so so Maybe one of the strategies could be to have a strong social movement that is in the streets, which is pushing uh, for the reforms that uh, that the lobbyists, like from uh, the citizen lobby, uh, could uh, advocate for. So, if you have a citizen in the lobby, like trying to explain something, and then you have thousands of people in the street backing what your um, what you are um, proposing, maybe this give you some bargaining power in face of the representative you're talking to. And the question is, for example, in the European case, does, that should need a European social movement. Mm -hmm. So how, how can the social movement, movement in, in, in each country could coordinate, like what kind of, of international coordination at the European level can, can be done so we can push the rep or European citizens can push the representatives in a more um, I don't know in a more <laughs> progressive way I would say uh, and I think that's the only power that the European citizens have and it, it, it that can actually counterbalance the financial uh, power at the European level then you have like the question of um, of violence because because such a movement would be um, highly repressed in the streets and we have seen that in France for example in Colombia. Yeah. thank you and we have a third question is there uh, by the way, I, I'm trying to assess whether we need a fourth wave. Uh, will there be other questions after these two or not? So it's like in a marriage, right? You speak now or you shut up for it? Or so. <laughs> okay, I'll, then I will take the two last questions. Hi, my name is Raman. I'm from Belarus. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. It's a very interesting topic, particularly for me because I don't think that we have lobbying in Belarus. <laughs> so up until today, I thought of lobbying as something super shady, uh, almost borderline illegal. And um, I started here in Epoch, I started to look at the automotive market. And um, I found out that lobbying actually plays a very important role. So in terms of power relations, uh, those companies, they influence the legislation uh, immensely. Um, so the other day we had a presentation from one of the European Union officials. I think he was from the European Union Innovation Council. And uh, I asked him what he thinks about lobbying. And I gave an example of the automotive industry um, that uh, companies often say one thing, but when you pull up the statistics on lobbying, you see that they are fighting for a completely different thing, especially in the green transition. Um, and what he said, this actually links to one of the final arguments that you made about the improvements in lobbying and transparency. So what he said is two points. First of all, he said that it's all completely transparent that if you want to check lobbying statistics, go online, it's all out there. And secondly, um, I'm not saying that it's a bad point, I agree on the second one with him. He said that we actually need um, like statistics and uh, research from the industry in order to understand where to go with the legislation. 
So in this respect, I, I think that lobbying is indeed quite um, useful. But my question is about this transparency. I, I very much like what you mentioned in the presentation that lobbying is efficient when it's discreet. Do you really think that this transparency register, that it makes any, any difference? When probably, I would assume that most of the um, sort of decisions, they are made behind closed doors. Like whatever they, whatever meeting they put up online, does it, does it really matter? Um, yeah, and maybe your ideas on the, on the overall improvements in, in lobbying in the European Union. Thank you. And uh, now, last but not least, So thank you also for me. I'm Peter from Germany and the UK, and I was really interested in what you were saying about expertise and how important expertise is in all of this, because it's, for me, like the lack of expertise for politicians, for decision makers, is the entry gate for this lobbyism to happen all the time. And it has been like massively rising. I mean, the context in the UK is where the government, they can't really make any decision themselves anymore. They're always just asking some kind of company to do their decisions for them, and those companies are also paid by all these other companies. So there's a massive uh, mm -hmm. question of um, uh, conflict of interest there. And I'm really wondering, I, I found it really interesting whether you could elaborate on, on as you're saying, the, the beginnings of this kind of being taken up in the EU and addressing that there is not enough expertise and wouldn't, shouldn't we go much, much more radically on this, that we need this expertise, not just on a EU level, but also very much on national levels, and even city governments and regional governments in the EU need this knowledge and need to have some kind of expertise they can rely on and reach out to whenever they may need it, instead of always having to rely on companies or uh, other business interests, or even, even civil society interests, which may be only certain ones may be getting a voice there. Um, yeah, that's basically my question. Okay, thanks for all these exciting wow. questions. So Laura, you have up to 15 minutes. Uh, and then we'll go for coffee. <laughs> and I know you have a microphone now, so don't do it. I finally got it. Yeah, so please. Um, the carbon the carbon market, the ETS in Europe, is not actually, the carbon is not really pricey. The price of the carbon is quite low. So I would argue that uh, at the end, old companies in the EU market win because the price is low. So there's been a lot of free permits and there's lots of exemptions. So, the, so it's never expensive to pollute, basically. So they are winning because it's not expensive to pollute. And they are winning because they are the ones that decide the price, you know. And um, so for me, that would be it. Um, I, I used to work for Friends of the Earth Europe for two years. And I had a colleague that was fighting against the ETS, but she was very lonely. And um, there's the Green Finance Observatory that has been created by a former banker that's been working on this also. But uh, because he's a former banker, you need a certain level of economics before you understand what he says. But uh, when I ask him and he explained a few times, I understand and uh, I, I see with his point. But uh, yeah, if you check the website, it's quite technical. And the EU could do a carbon tax. It's just that taxation is not the competency of the European Union. So maybe they can't. And even if they could, they would have to all the member states to agree. And probably Ireland or Luxembourg will say no. So. I don't think that technically also they have the tools to, to do it. It's one of the, of the problems. But they could incentivize the member states to do it at the national level. You know? They could coordinate. It's, it's the same thing because a lot of the time I will tell you, yeah, but they don't have the tools. But uh, when you have a pandemic and all of a sudden they need to spend a lot of money to companies and they have those state aid rules, that means that they can't give so much money to companies. But they, they find exceptions when there's a pandemic, you know? Or when they have to raise money on the on the on the markets for 
for months, you know, the next, what, what's called next generation EU, so it's EU recovery funds. A lot of them have, have been raised by the Commission on the markets. The Commission never did this before. They didn't even know if they could do this before. And then they found a way when they wanted to. So sometimes there's no tools and sometimes there's also no political will. Eh? Um, from the questions from Colombia and from Argentina, um, there's a big element that I don't know of, and then I think I'm too Eurocentered to answer. It's also the influence of foreign governments. Eh? You probably have also a lot of uh, lobbying from US firms and, and US government. Um, uh, I'm going to try and answer as, as much as I can. Um, the questions about national elites is interesting because uh, it goes back a little bit to expertise. So if you have a progressive government coming into power, you have an administration that's been here for years and maybe the administration doesn't have the will or the expertise or the political uh, will to put down your program. No? And this is something, uh, not that I'm a pro Varoufakis person, but uh, Greece finance minister wrote a book called... Um, um, ah, it's going to come back. There's been a uh, book. He recorded all his meetings uh, of the Eurozone in Brussels. Adults in the room, it's called. And there he mentioned how the Greek central bank, the head of the Greek central bank was never changed. And to him that was a problem because they kept somebody at a very high level with a certain expertise that they didn't have as a government and it actually became a block at the end. So I also think that if you change government, there's a whole administration also that you have to change. And you probably could put down a lobby ban. But again, if you put down a lobby ban, maybe you lose uh, some expertise. Because again, in some parts, you will have civil servants that will need the companies to their expertise, as you were saying. Uh, Euro European social movements, I would love th this to happen, but there's so much things that are difficult. I think you can have a European social movement uh, when you have a common enemy. So when we were against glyphosate or against the trade agreement, that's an easy common enemy so that you can bring all the Europeans together. There's an interest, so the Germans really didn't want GM food, the French were worried about climate, the UK were worried about NHS, and all the campaign was different in the different member states so that it bring out to people because people have different interests in the different member states. And um, there, yes, yeah, so there was a common clear enemy. The um, problem was uh, nationalized in the sense that we saw how it would change things in France and Germany, Italy in a different way. But for this to happen, it required a lot of people, a lot of money, a lot of coordination. And still, it doesn't mean that we made a huge demonstration in Brussels. We did make a huge demonstration in Berlin or in other capitals, but it was never a European social movement. It was never European. We never marched to Brussels and there was... I mean, most people would be against TTIP because Greenpeace Germany was against or because, I don't know, we common in Italy, not because actually at the European level it was called Seattle to Brussels network. Nobody knew who they were. So it's, it's possible, but I think there's a lot of things that are difficult. First, because most people don't know how the EU works and also because just in terms of identification, you identify nationally and you trust nationally as well. You trust your local NGO or you trust uh, environmental organization that you've seen a few times on TV, you trust someone that speaks your language and that, and that you've seen and that, yeah, some, you still identify nationally and that's a really big difficulty in terms of European social movement. And a lot of the time you lose at the EU level. So n for instance, when you work on, I know people that work on the common agricultural policy in France, um, they spend a lot of time just convincing people that they should care about what happens in Europe because it's a lot of time and it's a few results. So a lot of campaigners at the national level will tell you, or even social movements, they'll say it's, yeah, it's too much time for little results. Um, I think uh, a new question from Brother, some, oops, something I like to spot because, uh, um, so again, I'm not saying that all corporations are in are bad faith or they are, they are bad actors, but, um, Corporations do lie, you know. <laughs> uh, this is Business Europe uh, uh, climate strategy, and it's being leaked. And 
below it really says, you know, uh, Business Europe's gonna say that we want ambition, ambition officially, but we in reality, we don't want any strong rules, right? So it's important to get the expertise from the corporation, but it's naive to think that they don't have an interest in providing a certain side of the picture. And I think that's why expertise should never be fully trusted maybe by one person. So maybe you can ask expertise from the corporation, but maybe you ask an indep independent research institution also, and then you get two views. And you don't naively rely on what corporations tell you to think that this is the reality. Because it is the reality, but it is a vest, there's, there's an interest. It's a side of the reality that serves the interest of the company. And sometimes I feel that it's too naive and not enough, again, too technical and not enough political. They feel like the corporation are just going to kindly provide them information without any second thoughts. It's not the case. And it's normal, you know, I, it's the same thing with me. If I go and lobby a decision maker, I choose my arguments, I choose my facts in order to convince and the corporation will do the same. So as a decision maker, I would hope for them to be less naive and rely on different points of view. And I'm not saying that corporations expertise is not valid, but I'm saying it's not uh, neutral. And that's when I was talking to you about it, uh, technical. It's uh, when you hear an official replying to this, you hear someone that does a very technical uh, discourse. And what I miss is the political side of things. Because corporations are also political entities and they have an interest when they give you information. So yeah, you need expertise from industry, but you can't always fully and blindly trust it without actually, to me, getting other kinds of expertise. Um, the transparency register. It's true that it doesn't make much difference, but if you had sanctions behind, it would make difference. So when Monsanto and Fleshman Hillard's their contracts were published and it was 14 million, mm, 15 times more than what they registered, in Washington it would probably mean that some of those people would end up in jail. Because what they registered is different from what really happened, so they will get a lawsuit and they will end up in jail. This is not what uh, happens in Europe, so of course um, it would be better if it was uh, more ambitious and it was, if it was and if it was compulsory, but you would also need sanctions with it. You would need a way of sanctioning people that don't respect it. And I think this would really make the difference. But again, uh, I'm trying to find the date because I don't want to say anything st stupid, but um, there's an interesting, st I've put it here. There's an interest, oh, okay, anyway. <laughs> there's an interesting thing in, um, in 2017, Barroso used to be the president of the commission until 2016. And then Barroso went to work for Goldman Sachs, uh, the big firm. And a year after, wow, merci, thank you. Uh, yeah, so Barroso in 2016 leaves the commission and goes to work for Goldman Sachs. It makes a bit of a scandal, even from inside the commission. So there was a petition by employees of the commission asking Barroso to leave his job because they were saying, guy, what you're doing is really having a bad image on the commission. He still goes to Goldman Sachs. In 2017, he works for Goldman Sachs. He meets Keitanen. At, the moment, at that moment, Keitanen is vice president of the commission. And they're friends because Barroso used to be his boss, right? They meet informally. They have a drink in a hotel bar in the EU quarter and they sing by journalists. And then two months later, three months later, the meeting is still not registered anywhere. As, and the Caitlin should register meetings with external stakeholders. That's what uh, Matt Stell told us. That's the law. When Caitlin, because there were photos and stuff, so he couldn't deny it. When Caitlin is asked why he didn't do it, he doesn't understand why he has to do it. He says, well, you know, I was just talking with a friend. What's the problem? And here again, it's the same thing with expertise. Yeah, of course it's your friend. I'm not denying it's your friend. I'm just saying that he works for a big firm and he probably is also trying to get inf intelligence, you know? And maybe today you only talked about your wives and your kids, but who knows, in two weeks he might call you and ask you something about, uh, you know, uh, recovering phones or whatever. So maybe he's just keeping a relationship that at some point might become prof professional and then he might be able to get prime information about what's going on in the information that's going to serve Goldman Sachs, not just for lobbying, but also in terms of the financial markets for investing. So there will be a private and a financial private and a political gain from gaining prime information from Caitlin. So 
it's true that the rules maybe don't make a difference. What you also have to change is the ideology, you know, the mind of the people that are uh, taking decisions. Um, the lack of expertise. Uh, I don't know enough about the UK, but what really strikes me is uh, I studied in the UK and I have this idea that there's amazing universities, the expertise there is in the UK. It's a political choice not to go for universities, for instance, rather than go for companies, because universities do subcontract and do can make studies. So, so there's also, yeah, politicians decided to go to companies, then they could go to universities. They, again, they could have counter views also, maybe request two or three studies on the same issue to get different points of view. Um, you can see this clearly in, um, in, in the EU with MEP assistance. So a member of the European Parliament, they usually have two or three assistants. And most of the time they're quite young and when they arrive, most of the times they don't really know everything and it's normal, you know, if you work in a committee on environmental health and, uh, and food safety, uh, you can't know everything about chemicals, about food additives, about and health, you know, it's too much. And most of the time from uh, people working there, they tell me, well, you know, you've just started, you don't know half of what you're talking about. And you're not going to call your boss every five minutes, you know? So who do you call? Well, you know, you call somebody from industry and they explain you everything and then they can even get your jobs done. This is what you see in the um, Parlement, the, the series that uh, Mats also showed, that there are assistants that, you know, they have, uh, it's too, there's so many things to do and they don't know all the time. So, But again, here, the MEP's assistants, maybe they don't want to call their boss because they don't want to sound silly. But maybe they can call, you know, there might be a call centre in the European Parliament or a think tank. The think tank in the European Parliament only has five people, so they can't do this. But maybe if you, you know, you pull it up, you've got 30, 40 people and some of them can be on call so that the assistants can also call the internal think tank. And it's also knowledge that you keep inside, you know, and because with uh, assistants and MEPs, they change every five years. But if you have a think tank, you keep also a history of the knowledge. So sometimes there's structurally there's not enough expertise, but again, it's a political choice not to provide this expertise. Um, well, how do you do expertise? I think to me it's, imp it's important how you do expertise, who does expertise, but also the level of expertise. Like sometimes in EU policy discussions, I feel like, wow, are we not putting too much expertise into something that could be much more, much less complicated? Or also, Maybe we can have expertise on details of the law, but publicly, when we speak to journalists, when we speak to media, when we speak to people, can we not also all simplify what we say? Because we all have this, you know, it's, it's exactly the drawing I was showing you, we all have this feet into that bubble. Because we've all done amazing studies and we speak lots of languages and we understand this, but isn't it our responsibility, everyone that knows how this works to actually always have a foot outside and be able to explain it to everyone. What I'm trying to say is that at some points, sometimes the expertise can also be a way, an easy way not to actually try to think about how do I communicate easily on this? How do I explain what I do to my grandma, you know? And maybe this is something that, you know, maybe that should be part of the way we recruit civil servants. Why don't we ask them to do a five minute uh, exposure about uh, explain me what you do? And then they are taught and they feel that they have the obligation to depoliticize and de expertize what they do in order to have public conversations about it, you know? I hope I answered the question. <laughs> yeah? <Okay. laughs> Thank you.